Yeah, welcome everyone. So my name is Jenna Gatsky. I run uh, Prairie Springs Environmental Education Center. I'm super excited to have Roberto here to talk to us. Um, I have not heard this presentation myself, so I'm kind of excited. But without further ado, I will let Dr. Brennis start you off here. So my name is uh, Roberto Brennis. I, uh, I teach I faculty here in the biology department in Carroll. I am originally from Costa Rica and I have been working with amphibians for the last 20 years or so and uh, most of the time that I work with amphibians I've been working in amphibian decline. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about a little bit of the things that I have worked with in, uh, in amphibian decline and uh, uh, especially at the, uh, I mean very, very excited to tell you what we've been doing at the field station and, uh, and the work that we've been doing out there. So it will be a little bit of blast from the past. Then uh, when I used to work with uh, chytrid fungus and ranavirus, and uh, and now the more uh, newer thing that we're doing with the uh, bulk torrent now. Okay, so again, so I um, want to be talking to you guys about uh, the work I've done with um, feeding on decline and tell you a little bit about what's happening with the frogs um, lately and uh, uh, how frogs have been declining for, for a while and then the, uh, what is happening right now. So as uh, some of you guys may know, uh, amphibians are in distress. Um, we are in the red list. They're red listed, about 32% of amphibians around the world are red listed, which means they're in some type of stress, uh, in danger or in decline or, or you know, going extinct. So a lot of amphibians around the world are um, going in, uh, in this list. Now from these 32% amphibians, about 43% are actually in decline and we see uh, decline in uh, populations in um, local populations and also global populations in there too. So you see what is happening around the world at this point in uh, in time. So you see it's a big effect of decline all over the world. You compare, for example, North America, uh, we have about nine uh, critically endangered species and about 24% of uh, species are in danger. So for a, you know for the amount of species we have, that is a pretty serious number. And if you go into places like Costa Rica, for example, or the tropics where I used to work, then you see a way more um, a, a big effect in there. So we have about 32% of species in danger and 21% of species are clearly in danger. And these are areas are super diverse so uh, when you talk about 21% of species, you're talking about a lot of a lot of frogs in there that are in danger. When you see uh, the species that how is changing now, and how many species we are losing uh, right now, if we compare North America, doesn't look too bad because we have very few number of species, about 200 and some. So it doesn't look as bad. In, in yet we have a lot of species uh, they are in, in you know declining, but we don't have numbers. They will talk about how much species are going extinct so we have very few of the species because we have large large populations and uh and, and we don't have that many stream dwelling frogs either but when you see things places like like central america for example then you see a lot of species in there they are suffering these are mostly uh stream dwelling species few numbers as ecologists will know few numbers uh, a lot of a lot of species so in this case, we see a lot of species declining and there are about 20 species uh, extinct or uh, presumably extinct just in Central America, in Mexico, and about, about 60 species, they have a reduction of about 90% of the uh, populations in there. So this is, of course, very serious numbers that we are losing in there and very rapidly too. Some of the places are even more scary. If you see places like in South America, just in the last years, we have about 50 species they have uh, been declared extinct or um, or they presume to be extinct. So a lot around the world, a lot of decline and uh, this has been happening for about 20 years. So I'm gonna uh, go back about 20 years and tell you how uh, I'll tell the story, how this happened and how we start finding out about the species declining and how uh, people start, you know, looking into this. So the first, the first things, the first signs of trouble that we saw is about 20 years or so in the 80s. And in the 80s, everything started with this toad in here. This is called the golden toad. It's a toad that is uh, endemic of Costa Rica, central Costa Rica. Costa Rica in the 80s was an, uh, a place that was uh, very, a lot of people working there. It was easy access, a lot of frogs, uh, very easy to work. So we found a lot of uh, people working in there and they would do a lot of surveys. 
And this frog was endemic, very specific, very, very small population, very, very lo locate, uh, located in a place called Monteverde, which is a very pristine forest and the forest is very good. So uh, when they noticed was, as time passes about in the 19, at the end, late 80s, we start seeing declining in the frogs. These frogs will only come out like once a year and they will be what we call explosive breeders. So they will come in high numbers and you will find a lot of them for a little, little period of time. And then after that, they will disappear and you don't see them again till next year. So there will be uh, these explosive uh, events that they, they will be, the herpetologists will go there to, uh, to count them and stuff like that. And they start seeing a decline in the populations starting in the late 80s through the 90s and the last individual that was found was in 1992. And after 1992, uh, there was no more sign of this species. We uh, haven't seen uh, other ones since. And uh, of course, we are pretty sure that this, this species is extinct. So the, uh, this was the first really documented decline of the species. And at this point, it, it was very interesting because it was not necessarily linked to a habitat destruction or any really anthropomorphic event. It was no uh, hunting of the animals. It was no, nothing they would say that the animals would be declining. It was a pristine forest and then suddenly the frogs just start disappearing. So nobody really know what's happening. It took some years to uh, figure out. And between the 1992 to about the years uh, 2000, 2005, was when the, the clues start coming out and we start seeing a lot of effects they were affecting the frogs. So there are many, many reasons where the frogs seem to be declining back then and even now. And, and even now. So we know the things like global warming, for example, is affecting uh, the, the time with frogs breed, the amount of water they have available to and things like that. So that affects, of course, loss of habitat, very important around the world when we're cutting down forests and things like that, over exploitation, some places where they eat the frogs or uh, even the pet trade when we use frogs, I have frogs in my house, so I'm as guilty as anybody else. So all this exploitation, all this lost habitat and stuff is of course contributing to the decline of the amphibians. But this didn't, couldn't explain really local extinctions or even global extinctions to the, to the level that we were seeing around the world. So there were two main things that uh, we think that was the biggest cause or we think is the biggest cause of the uh, decline of the amphibians. And those are uh, invasive species. We are just learning about this. And this is, I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about at the end of the talk uh, of what we're doing in the, at the field station that uh, is related to invasive species. But the big thing that uh, was happening in the 90s and it was very popular in the 90s and everybody was working on this was the uh, emerging infectious disease. So we found uh, new, new disease that were affecting frogs and then we're wiping populations up. So I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, the work that I done with this, this emerging infectious disease, especially two diseases that are very um, affecting amphibian populations a lot. So um, the two main in disease that are affecting amphibians are, going, are the BD or the chytrid fungus. And the chytrid fungus is, again, these are emerging, emerging diseases. We didn't know any about this species until about the 1990s. So uh, all this information came after the 1990s. So the um, uh, uh, chytrid fungus is a disease that is as non-systemic, so which means is that it doesn't really enter the bloodstream of the animal, affects the skin of the animal. And because it affects the skin of the animal, all it has is a local innate immunity. It doesn't really have the capacity to defend itself because it doesn't really go into the system. It, it don't have the opportunity to build up white blood cells and the whole thing required for uh, a mounted immunity. So the, the animal depends only on antimicrobial peptides of the skin. So the, it only depends on how much the skin can defend them from the invasion of this of this fungus. We see this mostly in the tropics. It's very localized above 1200 meters. So in the mountains, the problem is the mountains in the tropics as with the, most of the diversity of frogs are. So we find uh, a lot of, again, like, a, like I said, very, a lot of species, they have very few individuals. Uh, so wiping out this whole species is, is much easier to do in the tropics than it is in the, in the temperate zones. So uh, this uh, fungus is, is one of the, the one that we localize as the one that is producing most of the declines in the tropicals, in the tropics. 
And the temperate zones, on the other hand, we have another problem in there that is the ranaviruses. And ranaviruses are different, they're viruses. And as we now are super familiar with viruses and we understand a lot about viruses, this is a systemic virus. So this actually goes inside the system of the animal, travels in the blood to the animal. So the animal does have the opportunity to mount uh, uh, immune defense, uh, systemic immune defense and in, in involves things like macrophages in the destruction of, of the virus. The problem is this, this, this is a, um, an emerging infectious disease. So it's not really memory. It's not really an adaptive immune response from the animal. So the immune response, although uh, occurs, is not as successful as would it be in something that is a, um, an endemic uh, disease or something like that. So this is more, uh, doesn't have the restrictions that the the, the chytrid fungus has is more is more dispersed everywhere in the world and is mostly affecting places like North America and Europe, low, 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 lowlands, highlands. It doesn't really have much of a problem. It's not restricted as the chytrid fungus more to the highlands in there. So uh, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about each of these virus, each of these disease, and how does it work in the animal and why it's killing these animals in here. So I'm going to start with the uh, with the chytrid fungus. Drinking coffee, in case you wonder what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, the chytrid fungus is, um, before we understand how the chytrid fungus kill the frog, I want to have to tell you a little bit about frogs and how frogs work. So frogs are, are ectotherms, right? They're cold-blooded and they are very close to the aquatic, aquatic um, ancestors. So they will still find in frogs, they have live skin. So what that means is they can breathe through the skin. As you guys probably know, they, they can ex ex bring oxygen and exchange carbon dioxide. And in there, they're gonna have those peptides that we talked before. So the peptides will be in the skin. And because this skin is life, they can bring in things through the skin into the system. So inside the skin, in there, in the, they have two layers. So the, the skin will have two layers, the epidermis, which is the outside layer, and the dermis, which is the lower layer in there, that's connected with the blood. There in the epidermis, we find what is called uh, lady cells. And these cells are cells that contain keratin. And keratin is the same thing you have in your nails, in your hair and stuff like that. So this is, uh, uh, these this, uh, cells give a little bit of harness to the skin of the frogs. And that's why you see toads, for example, and toads have a lot of these cells. And that's why they're dry and druggy and, uh, uh, and kind of coarse. And then some frogs have much less of these cells. And those are the ones that are very slimy and very, very soft and stuff like that. So these cells, are localized in certain parts of the frog. We find them in the hands, we find them in the, in the feet, in the tail, in the mouth of tadpoles, and uh, in the legs of tadpoles too. But most importantly, we find them in the ventral patch of frogs. In the ventral patch of frogs is this area uh, in the stomach where most of the exchange of waste happens. So as the frog produces things like nitrogenous waste and things like that, they also exchange to the ventral patch. So the ventral patch is like the exit of all this waste. And this waste, of course, is toxic and they wanna get rid of this waste at all times. So in this area, when they have this high exchange of waste, they're gonna have a lot of these cells in there. So the problem is now that our friend here, the, the chytrid fungus, have an aquatic sauce for the loves uh, the, this keratin. So it loves the keratin, so as it swims in the water, it will get to the frog. And when it gets to the frog, we'll insist in the keratin cells. So enters to the keratin cells and basically it's a spray around, sits in there and it starts replicating really fast. So as it replicates really fast, it starts producing, of course, a lot of new fungus and the fungus continue to grow and continue to grow. The frog doesn't know what to do because they feel that something is there but doesn't know what to do. So the solution of the frog is to start producing a skin to try and cover the fungus or cover the infection. So they produce more skin, more skin has more Keratin, more keratin has more opportunity for the fungus to grow. So what's happening is the fungus will reproduce very, very, very rapidly and start producing a lot of layers of skin. As they produce more and more and more layers of skin, oops, what it does is actually stop the exchange of waste. So the waste will stop and it's not really wait for the frog to get rid of this waste. And as the waste start getting accumulated inside the frog, then we're going to see problems in there like we're gonna see uh, what is called hormone regulatory inhibition, which means they cannot really exchange water or ions or different any kind of solids for that matter. And also we see that it's not able to exchange those uh, toxic byproducts like nitrogens and stuff like that. 
this is very dangerous because what happened at this point is this toxic byproducts are going to start kidnapping our things that they need like calcium and sodiums and things like that so the frog basically start poisoning itself and there's no way to exchange or get rid of this waste so we see most of the accumulation of this um these areas when the, the the exchange of waste is here in the ventral patch so you see an arrow here it shows the ventral patch and you see the ventral patch you see a lot of hemorrhage in there in the ventral patch we, we call pectination which means it's all these blood vessels in there we see an increase in blood vessels as the frog tries to get rid of that of that waste but i can't get rid of the waste because again we have those extra layers of skin and as that happened then the frog trying to get more skin on top of it to try and cover that. So we find frogs, for example, like in this case, this frog in uh, uh, in Panama, did you see the excess of skin that we we'll call it sloughing? And the sloughing, they continue to produce more and more of this skin, which means it produce more and more uh, of these layers, they start blocking and more and more the exchange. So as they start blocking the exchange, you will see it's a kidnap of things like calcium, for example. If you don't have calcium in your blood, then you're not able to move your muscles, so you will get paralysis. So frogs get paralyzed and eventually will get a heart attack and they die. And it's super sad because they die in, in a, a way that is uh, very, very sad. So this frog, for example, here you see it, is uh, uh, raising the ventral patch as she tried to exchange uh, the, the toxic waste. but. Uh, she can, and then she paralyzes, and then she dies. So this frog in here, this picture, as you see, this frog is actually dead. And if you touch it, then what you see it, see just fall like that, because it's completely paralyzed and it's not be able to move. And uh, this happens to, uh, the, the way that this, this fungus move is very small. So it can be moved by raindrops, it can be moved by birds, and whatever has keratin, like the bird fe feathers, the, the field, uh, fish scales, insects, whatever has keratin will move this, this fungus around. So it gets dispersed really quickly across the, across the field and it affects everything at the same time, from the, from the river to the trees to everything gets at the same time to all the frogs. We find frogs, there are tree dwelling frogs, uh, subterranean frogs, aquatic frogs, everybody at the same time dying. So um, I work in central Panama, uh, for uh, two years when I was doing my dissertation on this, and uh, uh, we recorded declines, very, very drastic declines in populations in there. So if you see in here, these are surveys that we did. The first graph shows mortality in the, um, in the axis, you can see proportion death and then the year. And as you see at the year passed by, we really have very low mortality in this area. And around 2004, when we were working in there, when the chytrid fungus got there within a month, you have pretty much everybody die within a month. Like 80, 85% to 90% of the uh, species were all gone. And uh, I used to find something like uh, about 100, 100 frogs a day when I was working there. And after the fungus, I would find like maybe five or six. And if you see at the other side, the density, the amount of frogs that uh, we lost during those times, and you see the density of frogs, which is the amount, how many frogs you have in the stream at this time of the year. Then you see by 2004, 2005, we have a gigantic drop in the density, which means that all the frogs were pretty much gone. So all these are graphs that show the adult populations. So these were surveys that we would do every day, walking the streams, counting at the frogs. And uh, so we noticed that all the frogs, of course, were gone with the chytrid fungus got there. I used to work with tadpoles at the time, and we surveyed the uh, populations of tadpoles as well. And the population of tadpoles, as you see, uh, in the year previous to the um, to the chytrid getting there, and the year after the, the the chytrid got there, you see the difference in population of tadpoles. And what, I, what this means is the frogs, the adults were dying. There was no uh, recruitment because if you don't have adults, you don't have tadpoles, you don't have tadpoles, you don't have babies, and you don't have babies, you don't have new frogs. So as the adults were dying, we're also losing the recruitment of the frogs, and this is what will lead a local uh, a local decline of populations in there. In this particular area, uh, where I used to work in central Panama, we used to have a very high density of frogs and a lot of species of frogs in there. And after Kitrip, it was maybe 10% of the frogs uh, that were left in this place. So very drastic changes with this chytrid fungus, very, very, very dispersed around the world. We find it everywhere pretty much around the world and, and, um, and it's very dramatic in the tropics. Uh, some frogs do survive and we see some frogs, they are able to make it. 
Uh, if the frog lives below the 1200 meters, it has a pretty good chance because the fungus does not like the heat. So it likes the temperature to be cold. So they like to be in places when it's above 1200 meters. Uh, so the frogs, the lowland frogs like this, uh, very famous red-eyed tree frog, which lives in lowlands and swamps. These frogs are not really affected by it too much. Also, these frogs have a lot of peptides in the skin, so they can survive in there. Uh, some other frogs will have other defenses like antimicrobial uh, skin peptides, uh, or some frogs can actually have being able to bask. And when they bask in the sun, uh, they raise, raise the temperature of their bodies they seem to be able to get rid of the fungus. Uh, the problem is, again, this fungus is well distributed. It's a part of a big family of fungus, a fungi that, um, that is, so, is good. Most of them are good. It's only one that is bad. So we cannot just go and spray antifungal in these places because then you will kill the good fungus and the bad fungus, which uh, no, will not be good. So at this point, we don't really have a solution. The solution right now is to, uh, we try and save some species and some, the zoos are, are, are contributing a lot and in, uh, in having species in there and, you know, save the species for, for later if we save, if we figure out how to save it. But at this point is not really much uh, of um, solution for this particular fungus. So we, it's a lot of people working on it and we keep working on it, but uh, it's not really much. The, the reality right now is that we are losing a lot of the species. This frog in here is a frog, and I show you this picture because this we this is a, a, a frog that we uh, discovered. So I, I I discovered this species. I was the first person to find this species, and I, I was named after my mom and my dad. And uh, um, and the saddest thing of it is that a friend of mine and me are the only two people, and will be the only two people to see this frog alive because we collected it in an area that was already. Uh, attacked by the by the fungus, and uh, we went back many times after, and uh, we haven't been able to find another one of these. So this species is it was dead before even uh, discovered for for the world. So it's very sad, and we find the places like the tropics in Panama, Costa Rica, places like that. A lot of frogs they um, they're gone, and, and we don't know exactly how many how many species we lost in the last uh, years because after the fungus. We don't know really what, what, what happened after that. So uh, very, very sad and very, very cosmopolitan again. Uh, it moves. We know where it's at. We know it's moving south. And uh, right now it's, it's crossing in the central, the middle of Panama. It's lowlands. So because it's lowlands, it's slowed down a little bit. So um, in some also coming from the south, from Colombia, from the Chocos in Colombia. So there's some areas in Panama and so in, in, in Western Panama where we can still find um, frogs the uh, areas without chytrid but uh, in most areas it's already gone and uh, it will never be the same i guess so this is the chytrid fungus again very bad and and mostly found in the tropics the other problem that we have is uh is a virus and this virus is called uh, ranavirus ranavirus is a pretty old virus it's pretty big and the same as with coronavirus has oh, have uh this a uh, the envelope have, will have these proteins and here, these surface proteins, they allow them to enter a very different host. And uh, we find them in a lot of, in lower vertebrates and also in invertebrates. Oops, this thing is moving by itself now. Uh, so we find them in, in, uh, in invertebrates, like in insects, some insects, and, and then we also find in lower vertebrates, like uh, fish and, and frogs in there. So it's a really big virus and uh, same as coronavirus. The, the problem with this virus is it has two, two forms. It has a naked virus and an envelope virus. And the naked virus is really hard to, uh, to catch for, in the, for the immune system because it disguises and it's very hard to get. So this, fungus, this virus, what it does is uh, it starts building up crystals and it will build crystals inside the, inside the envelope. And then when it's, when it's ready, we'll release the, the crystals they will go into the cell, the cell will start building up the crystals, and then uh, when the crystals are ready, they will destroy the cell. So this is what we call a hemorrhagic virus. They will destroy lysis the cell to be able to exit and uh, the envelope one, and then this will produce a hemorrhagic, and then it's very, very bad for the frog. So when you see frogs, they get ranavirus. 
Uh, some of the signs you'll see will be edema, and this is a lot of bleeding in their internal bleeding, as you can see in this tadpole in here. And uh, most of the pictures are tadpoles because I work with tadpoles, but you can see also in adults too. So uh, in this case, the tail, and you can see what the gills are, it's going to be there a lot of bleeding, internal bleeding in there. We see ulceration and erythema, which means there is swallowing and it's a lot of water in there. So uh, especially in the uh, extremities of the tadpoles in here, so you see this frog, this tadpole, the, the legs are really, really swollen and uh, it's having have ulcerations in there too. Internally, we see a lot of damage in there. We see a lot of bleeding of the uh, organs, especially things like the kidney. It's very sad when you open a, a tadpole that has uh, ranavirus because basically it's melted inside. It's, everything gets gets melted and it's like just basically a soup in there when you open it in there. On the other hand, a lot of the blood is taken off, so we see a lot of the swollen and pale organs in there. In this case, this, this liver in here looks very, very, very pale, and the gold bladder is going to get also kind of inflamed, inflamed in this case. So um, very, very different in this case. And uh, if you go histologically speaking, you're going to see a lot of degeneration of the kidney. If you see in here, the, the little purple cells are normal cells and the big gigantic cells are degenerated cells. So uh, these cells, of course, non-functional, and they basically what they're doing is getting empty as the virus start filling them up with these crystals and is ready to release them into the system uh, and you know, infect other, other, um, other uh, cells. We see a lot of necrosis of the liver too. You see in this point here in the middle and what this red circle is. Uh, this is not as obvious as the other one because the picture is not as close, but you see the cells in the top of the picture are gonna be bigger and pink and the ones in the middle are all white and all the nuclei get together. What that means is that all the, the cells are actually broken, the lysis and all the contents are out and all the, the, the nuclei um, gathers in the middle. So you can see that that big group of nuclei in the middle and that's because all the cells are empty in that case. Uh, the same thing you see in the spleen. This one is a better picture in here and you can really see how the cells in the middle are completely dead. So very, very bad, very, very sad to see uh, frogs getting in there. And it makes you wonder if we were to get a disease like this. So if we were to get a disease like this, how would it be the symptoms for a human? So in the first day on Monday, you will get some fever. By Wednesday, you will have your hands and feet completely swollen. By Friday, you'll be you'll be uh, sweating, and you'll be uh, coming blood out of your ears and out of your eyes because it will be a lot of internal hemorrhage and things like we see in Ebola and things like that. Big swollen too of the extremities and things like that. And by Sunday, we'll be done, right? So uh, we will be asking to get put down by Sunday in there. So it's really no cure for it. We don't know um, how to stop it once it gets inside the system. Macrophages have action and then have immune response. Immune response is different in different frogs. Some frogs seem to do better than others, but we don't really have any way to stop it once it gets inside the cells. The good news is there is an active above 21 degrees Celsius. So we are too hot for, for this, uh, this virus. So we wouldn't get uh, this virus. No hybrid breads can not get it but uh, um, it's, it's very bad and again, systemic in there. We see among frogs and we tend to believe the frogs are frogs and the all immune systems are the same, but uh, of course, different frogs have different uh, immune, de immune defenses and then different response in there. So we see different signs in different frogs. Some frogs have more than others. Green frogs, for example, in this case, are uh, very affected. Uh, gray tree frogs also we see a lot of signs in there. And this one here is the worst of them all, uh, wood frog. This frog is what we understand as a super spreader. And this one is not just able to uh, get the virus, but it's able to multiply it and, and distribute it to uh, the whole population. So what we see in this case is we have a lot of differences in immune response. And then depends on the frog and depends how the frog can deal with this, with this virus is how there's going to be the, um, the response. Some frogs, like narrow mouth toads, for example, they don't even die. Nothing happened to them. They can go through it and they, they are fine. When other frogs, again, like the, like the wood frogs, within five days, they will be gone. So it's, a, it's very different, uh, the immune response, unless they have the chance to fight it uh, with, with the uh, immune response, different from the chytrid fungus, it's just depending on the skin. 
how this thing, uh, the, the, the virus is transmitted, the different ways to transmit it. And that's again one of the problems too. You can have direct, direct transmission, which means actually can be in the water, can be shed by epithelial cells into the water. So if it's in the water, other, other animals will get it. And when you have things like, uh, like wood frogs, for example, they are super spreaders. When you put it in there, immediately it's gonna go and it's going to affect other species in there. Um, also uh, by contact, of course, when the frogs touch each other, when the frogs are um, breeding or things like that, they should be wearing masks like we do, but they don't. So no, no, no uh, social distance for frogs. So that's the problem right there. And uh, uh, so they pass. Then it takes one second of contact for the fungus to act, uh, for the virus to actually be transmitted. So very, uh, very, very little contact. So very hard to stop it in there. And also, of course, if you eat it, if, if an animal eat another animal. Then, it, because it's systemic, it can go. It can get released inside the system of the animal, and if anything, it's going to be fastly distributed up in there. Another big problem that this virus has is that because, like I said in the beginning, it's a very old virus, and the uh, and the member proteins are very, very old. Then uh, we see a lot of movement among the species in there, and this is what I did for my dissertation. And uh, um, I work with the how the pro, the virus can jump from one uh, animal to the other, and we see the virus moving from amphibians to fish, fish to reptiles and so on. So this is a big problem for the frogs because fish stay in the pond and reptiles stay in the pond and they're gonna be there, uh, turtles and fish are gonna be there for, for the long time, long term. So frogs go out and they, they, they have the tadpole stage, they leave the pond, they go and live their life and when they come back and they release their eggs into the into the water, then the, the tadpoles will be released and then the tadpole immediately will contract the virus and then it will die. So uh, very, very fast uh, uh, killing the frogs in that particular case. It also persists because of this and because it can be in reptiles and can be in fish, you, you see it persisting in the environment. So it stays in ponds, it stays in water. It can, it can even stay in the soil for a little bit of time. So sometimes the, frog, the, the pond will dry up and then when it fill back up, then the virus will already be there and then the frog can, can get it. And if it's a wood frog, for example, it will give it to everybody and everybody will die. So we see a lot of local extinctions because of this, of this virus in there. Also, uh, sometimes it depends how the immune system of the, of the frogs are. Some frogs are more resistant than others. So some frogs are able to get the virus and move it to another pond. And when they get to another pond, it will be shed in another pond. And, uh, and what happened then is if you, for example, have a frog that is not very, um, they will not die very easily. You move it to another pond and it's a wood frog in the other pond. Then that, that, that wood frog will take that virus, amplify it, and then will kill the whole community in there. So uh, very, very difficult to stop once the metamorphs start moving in there. And the other problem, like I said before, is that they can stay with fish and frogs, I mean, and, and reptiles. And the mortality is much less, we see, and especially in fish, uh, turtles get it and turtles will die when they're young. But if a frog get it, when a, a turtle get it, I'm sorry, when it's um, older, it's going to be very difficult to stop it because it will actually be uh, reproduced. It hides in the kidneys of the um, of the turtles and it, it, it fools the macrophages and they don't, know, they don't see it. And they can be shed when it pees or when the water comes out of the cloaca, uh, they will shed the virus into the system. And the virus, again, if you have a, a, a super spreader in there, the damn super spreader will take care of the rest and just give it to everybody else and wipe out populations in there. So we see it widely distributed in places like North America and Europe, and uh, uh, we have a lot of local extinctions. We don't have so far like like full extinctions that are attributed to ranavirus, but certainly we have a lot of declining populations and we have a lot of local extinctions that are being uh, attributed to the, to the ranavirus. The ranavirus also, because it depends on the immune system of the animal, it can also get, if the animal goes into a prone, uh, into a low immune system defense, then the, the ranavirus will take uh, hold on that and it will be worse. So we see it's different stressors, like natural stressors. When you have predators in the pond, for example, that will get stressed out and they're stressed out, then the virus will get entered much easily. We see, um, also, of course, depends the host, who the host is, how, how infectious this host is. 
And, and also we see a lot of effect from anthropogenic stressors like pesticides, fertilizers, nitrogenous waste, things like that. So whatever affects the immune system of uh, amphibians, it will also affect uh, how, the, how little this, 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 this virus is and how much uh, of these animals it will kill. The other problem it is, is it hides in there and sometimes it's hard to find, so it's very easy to move from one side to the other. So what we see is a lot of the commercial trade in the, in the world. Uh, in the South particularly, you see a lot of the uh, fishermen, they use things like water dogs for fishing, for example. So they will go to a pond and they will pull a lot of uh, a, a do water dogs in there or um, mud puppies in there, and they will move them to a different place for fishing. And that, uh, the virus will get shed in a different pond. So it's very easy to move from one side to the other. Uh, it's, it's, um, that it divides very rapidly. And as we understand now more than ever, uh, when you have a virus that is divides very rapidly, then you're gonna have vari variants pretty quickly. So it's a lot of variants now of the virus in different places, someone's worse than others. And uh, um, overall it's, it's pretty well distributed around the world and it's doing really, really bad effects, uh, really uh, terrible effects on frogs. So when we see things like the global trade of amphibians in there, then you can see how easily this, this, this virus moves from one side to the other and how easily it is the, uh, the, the frogs will be contaminated as they, as they send from one place to another. So a lot of the frogs that we get, for example, in pet trade, and again, I'm as guilty as anybody else, I do have frogs in my house, but uh, when you get uh, frogs in the system, then you don't know what kind of frogs are you getting. And uh, sometimes, uh, and this are, is a report from a couple of years ago, and these are the frogs that are coming from different parts of the world. And you see 89% uh, of the frogs coming from Hong Kong were actually tested positive. Dominican Republic about 70%, Madagascar about 57%. So all these frogs are coming in with low um, loads of virus. They get in here, they release the virus, and they get a super spreader in there immediately. They uh, they distribute the virus. So for pet trade, um, bringing uh, importing animals is very very difficult because they will they will bring in this virus uh, when they come. So. How are we trying to stop it and what we're trying to do? There are some regulations now. So in 2008, uh, it was, um, we started with called the OEA Aquatic Code. And that means that when frogs come from uh, outside the country, they need to be tested for ranavirus and they will be tested. And now we know if they have it or not, they will be certified, uh, clean certified uh, species so they can come into the country. And we know that that, um, you know, will stop the virus a little bit. For us and people that work in streams and ponds and any aquatic resources, we all we have to be very conscientious about it and uh, disinfect our nets, disinfect our boots. If we go from one stream to the other or one pond to the other or one area to the other, uh, taking care of course, disinfecting and trying to stop the virus from moving one side to the, to the other is, is very important. So these two disease, um, the Rana virus and the cutrid fungus are at this point rampant in the world, very well distributed. And uh, we think that most of the extinctions that we see are because of this, uh, this these two diseases, they are going again rampant everywhere. I think I, I, I think I spent a lot of time on this. So I'm gonna jump up this. So this is the things that I work in the past. So I work with Rana virus and I work with cutrid fungus before I came to Carol. When I came to Carroll, I, um, because I work with, with, with uh, the clients, then I started looking for other venues. And um, I want to talk to you now a little bit about what do I do, what, how I work with the amphibian declines and, and how the effect of invasive species is. So before I go to that, I need to tell you a little bit about um, a plant physiology. And here's your understanding. My former students will probably will love this. Uh, so. Plant, of course, do photosynthesis and photosynthesis produce energy and this energy is used for different things in, in the plant. One of the things the plant use the energy is to make, you know, to grow and to, uh, to make fruits and flowers and all the different things. But some of the energy the plant has, it will be dedicated for protection. And that protection is in the form uh, sometimes of secondary metabolites. Secondary metabolites are really large compounds very large compound, very hard to make, very expensive for the plant, and these sometimes are toxic to animals. So this, if, a, if an animal is exposed to these toxins, uh, it sometimes will die or will have, like in this case, stimulating effects 
in uh, uh, in animals in there. So some plants will have this, and uh, and this will have an effect on um, on animals. So now that we establish that, we can go to our problem case in here. This plant in here, this tree in here, is called the common buckthorn, and the common buckthorn is a very well very well distributed a plant across the uh, United States. It's a mid-sized tree or, or, or brush, and uh, it was introduced in the 19, in 1849, and uh, it was very successful and rapidly took over. It's originally from Northern Europe, but uh, when it got to the United States, it found a perfect environment. So very, very quickly it moved all throughout the United States, and we find it pretty much everywhere in the country, including uh, uh, Wisconsin, uh, where we live. So this tree is particular because this tree has uh, a lot of defense. It lives in, in forests when it gets a lot of predation in there. So it has a lot of defense and it spends a lot of its energy into producing defense. So there are two main defense the a tree needs to be able to survive, right? It needs to avoid competition. So we need to stop other trees from killing me or, or taking my, my resources. So for that, it will have uh, substances that stop the growth of trees around it, so it will inhibit neighboring plants for growing. And also it can use some of the energy in to produce those big, big secondary metabolites. And again, these are very expensive, so the plant is going to produce this and it's going to, oops, and it's going to use it to defend themselves from uh, predators in this case. So a modding, which is what we're we, uh, we working on, Emoting is being used for a long time as, a, as an actual uh, medicine in, in Chinese medicine, being used for, for a long, about 2000 years. And it's used for many things, anti-cancer, uh, liver problems, anti-inflammatory, uh, antimicrobial, different things like that. The problem with, the, with, this, with this compound is that it's really big. As you see, it's a, it's a really big compound. So to be able to, to utilize this compound, you're gonna have to have high metabolic function. So you're gonna to have to have a liver and the liver has to be a good liver that is actually producing a lot of, um, you know, metabolizing very quickly. The, if you cannot metabolize the liver, what you're gonna find is some uh, problems in there with the liver, like inflammation, congestion, necrosis, things like that. The same, the same symptoms that we see in cirrhosis of the liver, for example. So cirrhosis of the liver is the same idea. When you're trying to break down alcohol, if you don't have uh, a lot of uh, liver capacity, then you're gonna start producing some uh, dead cells in there and it's gonna be uh, pretty bad in the kidney and also in the liver. So emotin has an effect, different effect in animals that have high liver function and animals with low liver function. So we can divide animals in higher vertebrates and higher vertebrates will be animals that have if they're warm blooded and they have a lot of energy and these animals will have high liver function so you think about something like a bird or something like a, a mammal like a mouse or something like that they will have high liver function so technically speaking uh, they can take this emoting and they can break it down and when they break it down thanks to this um, high liver function they will be able to survive and the biggest biggest effect they have is they're going to have laxative effects so they're going to have in other words a huge diarrhea from uh, taking this, uh, consuming this, this, this uh, compound in there. This, the problem with this is the animals they consume this um, this compound is going to have a lot of diarrhea, like I said. So it's going to we're going to see a lot of weight loss and we're going to see a lot of poor energy reserves. And the problem with this is that you think about things like animals that need to hibernate or animals that need to migrate long distances. You need to have a lot of energy for that. And if you lost all your energy in a diarrhea, then you don't have enough energy to go to Argentina and back uh, flying in the case of a bird or to survive these harsh winters in the case of mice and stuff like that. So in high vertebrates, the problem is if you have too much of it, then you may not have as much energy as necessary. So if the animals are strictly eating that, there could be problems in the animals and maybe even they will die. If they have other sorts of food, then they can you know, compensate with other things and they will survive. The problem in lower vertebrates though, is the lower, lower vertebrates don't have high liver capacity. They have very low liver capacity as a matter of fact. And also for frogs, for example, the liver capacity will start very late in development. So for these animals, what we see is a lot of toxicity in the liver. So we see a lot of problems in the liver in there and we can see animals when they're, when they're young, for example, in the case of frogs, uh, tadpoles in this case, you see a lot of mortality, deformations in mortality in there in the uh, in embryos because they don't they cannot um, 
synthesize the the, the emoting and they and they die. So, so how this is affecting the frogs in the field station, for example, to to be able to understand how this affects, we need to understand how frogs work. We understand the frogs have uh, by by basic lifestyle. What this means is you see tadpoles and then you see frogs, right? The tadpole is the embryo of the frog. And as the embryo is literally like an embryo that is taken out from the inside of the mother and put in the outside. So it's very, very undeveloped. It's very, very cheap. It's not really have that much function. Uh, the organs are not really very functional or stuff like that. So things like, for example, the, the liver and the kidney, they will not be functional until the animal past metamorphosis. So they need to be restructured restructure and establish that during the metamorphosis of the animal in there. So when you see the life, st the life stages of a tadpole, in the beginning, of course, when, you, when it's an egg, when it's inside the, inside the egg mass, you're not gonna have any liver function in there. It's not really any movement of the liver in there. When the animal start developing in there, we're gonna see some development of the, of the, uh, of the liver and we'll see early development, we're gonna see very low liver function. And at this point, the liver, the main function of the liver is to make blood and, um, and it's not really much metabolic function at this point. As the animal gets older, then we're gonna see a little bit of increase in the, in the liver function. And eventually when the animal gets out of the water and is ready to go outside, then we're gonna see full liver function in here. That doesn't mean that it's great liver function, but it's, it's full liver function. The, the liver is doing what the liver should be doing at this point. So if you think about the development of the, of the, of the frog and the, and the different stages of the frog, when the frog is young and is very, very undeveloped, then we're gonna have very low to no liver function or, or kidney function for that matter either. When the frog gets old, then we're gonna see higher uh, liver function or, and kidney function as well. So during the early stages, what we see is the, the main function of the liver is to make blood. And for that, they have very low capacity to metabolize big compounds like alcohol. So or alcohol or emoting. So in this case, so then we see this very low capacity to, to break down uh, compounds like emoting. And because of that, then the frogs, we're gonna see this, a lot of mortality in there. We're gonna see mortality of embryos. And it's basically, they don't know what to do with this, with this compound and the compound uh, will produce the death of the animal. And I will tell you exactly how this happened here in a minute. When the animal gets older, then what we see is the, the, the liver function changes from, from producing blood to actually metabolic function. And when that happens in there, what we see is the animal now is gonna be able to start dealing with uh, large compounds like, like emoting. And now we, we're gonna see a breaking down the emoting and seeing high capacity of uh, metabol metabolizing the emoting in there. The problem in there is of course, they, they're able to metabolize it, but there's, like I said, at this point, the liver is okay, but it's not really that good. So if it's very little, it just dies. Flat out dies because they don't know what to do with that, with that compound. If it's a little older, at the later stages of, of tadpole development, then we're gonna see some, it, it, some problems in the liver in there. And here I will show you some of these uh, problems in the liver in there. So in here we see uh, what is called an hepatic cyst. Hepatic cyst is when the liver doesn't know what to do with a compound. So basically make this cyst to hold the compound in there for later on, uh, figure out what to do, I guess. So the, what you see is a lot of hepatic cyst in, in these livers. You're gonna see pale kidneys, the same thing that we saw with the uh, with the Rana virus, when the blood start getting drained, going to other places, trying to fight infections and stuff like that. So we see a very uh, a lot of uh, pale livers in, in this case. We see necrosis, and in this case, you see a little section of the liver that is missing in there when the uh, is just pretty much dead cells. The liver is a pretty dynamic organ, so as the as the liver loses. Uh, tissue, it builds tissue very rapidly. So what we're gonna see is uh, necrosis of the liver and then the liver trying to fix itself, a lot of scarring of the liver in there. We also see a huge enlarge, enlargement of the gallbladder and, uh, and what's happening is the gallbladder is actually receiving that sediment from the, from the liver in there. So when we go and we look at the inside of the liver or the inside of the kidneys, then what we see is, first of all, like I said, the liver is very, very dynamic and as the cells die, the cells get replaced. So we see a lot uh, of fibrosis of the liver. And the fibrosis, what it means is the it is scar tissue. So the liver, as the cells die, they get replaced and that replacement cells may, make a scar tissue. And then we see the, the liver, the, the, the animal trying to get rid of the morning. And by do that, they send it to the gallbladder trying to uh, they get rid of it because the, the gallbladder is connected to the intestines so they can get rid of 
by uh, the sea dogs. But the problem in there is that it, in the morning is a is a golden dust pretty much. It's like it's like dust and it's golden. So you can see here inside the gallbladder how it's sitting there and it's not able to leave the gallbladder. So it starts filling up the gallbladder, and we see at some points when the gallbladder gets completely full of of uh, emoting and it's not really way way to get it out. So when you see the liver, just looking at it, you can actually see the emoting. And if you see in here, in this picture in here, you can actually see the golden flakes inside the liver. And those golden flakes are just accumulations of emoting. They again, the, the frog doesn't know what to do with, so they just accumulate in there. And this will have an importance here in a minute when I tell you how this works. But uh, uh, as you see, you can see the, the accumulations of emoting in there. Another thing that happens is we find these inclusions in the kidney. And this inclusion in the kidney, we don't really know uh, what it is about. Uh, we think these are fat droplets, they, they get accumulated in the kidney. We have a lot of them. And uh, uh, we don't see them in the liver, we see them mostly in the kidney. And we, at this point, don't understand what those are for. Uh, we haven't been able to work much in kidneys. We are very concentrating in livers now. Uh, so this is the next step is to try and figure out what those inclusions are and what they're doing in there in the kidney of the animal. But what we do know now is how the how the kidney works, I mean, how the emoting works and how the emoting affects. So I'm going to tell you now the story here of how this works and be with me. And I hope you love this because it takes a long time to be able to get this. So I hope you guys love this, this slide here. So this is how the uh, emoting affects the liver function. In there. So emoting, because it's a big compound, it's a large compound, like I said, is breaking down in the liver to what is called the phase one uh, metabolism. So this, what they do is basically biotransform bio the, the liver. So basically what this means is they cut it in little pieces. To cut in little pieces is catalyzed by something that's called the phytochrome 450. And this is what the little scissors are going to go and start chopping up the, 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 the emoting little pieces. And once it's chopped out in little pieces, they can just get it to the gallbladder. When they get to the gallbladder, they can be then disposed to the intestine, to the bile duct. So, this works beautifully if you have full liver function, right? So you are, when you drink alcohol, for example, it's something very similar that happens with you. You drink the alcohol, the next day you may have a little bit of hangover because this is what's happening there. Your kidney is working on trying to destroy that those big compounds in there. So if the, if the tadpole is adult or a frog is an adult or is a, a, a late development tadpole, then basically you go through phase one metabolism oxidation and then you get rid of your emoting not big problem. But the problem is when your liver is not able to do this, then what we see is the liver start, the, the emoting starts accumulating in crystals inside the liver. As they, as they enter the liver again, they cannot broken, be broken down and what they know will happen with this, then basically you start making these aggregations in there and it will, it will aggregate and start getting those big golden specks that you see in there. The problem with this is as you start getting all the golden specks is that a couple of things happening there, this problem. First of all, we start uh, seeing an increase in the ROIs in there, which means uh, there's gonna, this is the thing that break down the oxidant, they, they, they produce, oops, they produce the oxidation stress, right? So this one in oxidation stress, we see is an increase of the ROS in there, which means that there is not being able to break down what, uh, the, the compound in there. And also we're gonna see how these chunks start blocking the portal artery in there. So as this oxidation starts because the, the ROIs don't work, then what we see is the phase metabolism start working and the thing called, the whole thing stops. And as the whole, the whole thing stops, then cells start to die. And as the cells start to die, and then we're gonna block the entrance and the movement to the gallbladder in there. And at the same time, if we're gonna see more and more accumulation of the crystals in the gallbladder in there. So we see in this picture in here is, if you see the arrows in there, in the arrow, you see the bowel duct. This is the duct that connects the gallbladder with the liver. And if you can see, you can actually see the accumulation of, of emote in there in the actual vein. And if you see inside the gallbladder, this gallbladder is completely packed. And if you see this completely packed with this dust uh, emoting crystals in there. So all over the place, filling up the gallbladder and completely um, it, it blocking the pass of the blood. And what happened with that is that you have what is called fibrosis. So fibrosis again is gonna be all these cells are gonna start dying. And as the cells start dying, it's gonna start producing scar tissue. And as the scar tissue start, start occurring, what's gonna happen is start blocking those, those arteries that go into the liver. And as this start 
blocking the liver, we're going to what's called port portal hypertension. Portal hypertension, what it means is the blood is not being able to enter the liver. The liver starts getting full of this emoting, and that produces, again, more oxidation stress, which means it will stop the process even further. And now we have the whole thing collapses. So at this point, the liver is stopped being functional. And what we see here is a lot of hepatocellular congestion congestion here and the congestion means that the blood is not being able to move from the liver into the liver and then we cannot move things from the liver into the gallbladder so the whole thing again stops and then cells continue to die and we start seeing a lot of necrosis of the liver in there this continues if we continue this this necrosis of the liver eventually the, the liver will become completely uh, useless and the animal will die so that is how emoting works and this is what is killing the frogs. So if we take this information and we apply this information to we uh, to the, our field station, then how this affects our field station, right? So the field station, when I first came to, to Carroll uh, seven years ago, I uh, the first thing I did was a survey because I work with frogs. So I did a survey to the uh, frog to see what we have in there. So I compare um, the field station with a nearby natural area and see how, how many frogs were there and if we have uh, a, a good number of frogs in there. And what I found was that there were two main communities of frogs at the field station, or they should have been in there. So they are, we have temporal pools. So we have animals that will uh, breed in the early spring, like chorus frogs and cricket frogs and stuff like that. And then we have permanent frog, permanent ponds when you have big frogs, like green frogs and bull frogs and things like that. Permanent frogs, permanent poles, of course, are deep and uh, they stay year round and temporal pools will be dwelling, they only stay there for uh, a, a period of time, they're, they're temporal, and they will disappear. So as I started doing my, my surveys in there, uh, we found something interesting in there, and it was, uh, so this is my data from uh, back in the day, and uh, uh, as you see here, the, the light gray, the gray are the, the frogs at the field station, and if you see, there's basically nothing in there. So we have a lot of green frogs, some bullfrogs, and that's pretty much it. When the other place will have a lot of frogs in there of different species. So this was, of course, um, very uh, curious to me. So then we start doing some work on that and we find out, of course, that one frog is very abundant. And that is, if you ever been at the field station, you've seen tons of green frogs everywhere, uh, but you don't see cricket frogs or chorus frogs or any of those things. So the frogs they have it, uh, temporal pools seem to be gone and the frogs they inhabit permanent ponds seem to be actually doing really well in having a lot of frogs in there. So the question of course was why some frogs disappear and why some, why some frogs remain. So when we look at the frogs and the characteristics of the frogs and why the frogs are the way they are, then we see green frogs in here, which are very abundant, are uh, spring fed permanent, they live in permanent pools, they breed in the fall. So the tadpoles will overwinter and they can stay there for a long time which means the tap will be big and develop uh, in the, in, during the summertime, in the, in the, uh, during the fall time, I guess. Or the, I mean, sorry, the spring. In the spring, the tadpoles are very well developed because they spend the year in the, in the water. When these guys here, the chorus frogs, the chorus frogs are different. They're very little, they're very fast breeders. They come in the spring, they lay the eggs. In between four and 90 days, they're done and they're ready to go. So these frogs are going to spend very little time and they have to develop really fast. And then what we see in these frogs is that these frogs are all gone. So there are no frogs, there are no chorus frogs or cricket frogs or anything like that in, in, in actual amounts at the field station. I've heard one or two in my whole time in there. So when you compare these two frogs and how, how the fact the emoting uh, produce liver problems and kill the frogs, how it affects each of the species and why, why some species survive when other species um, die, then we have to see what they do and how they live. So if we see, the lifespan of these frogs through the year. So uh, we know the green frogs will lay the eggs in the summertime, which give the tadpole a lot of time to develop. So the tadpole will, you know, develop slowly. They get really big. They can be there up to 20, 22 months in there. So they can spend a lot of time in there. This means a lot of time to develop some functional livers and a lot of time to be able to maybe combat this, this emoting thing. When chorus frogs, we see chorus frogs, they're different. They leave the egg, they lay the eggs in the spring. The tadpole is there really quickly, 40 to 90 days, the tadpole is out and ready to go. 
and then they live their lives as adults the rest of the year, they come back the next spring. If we see our friend here, the, uh, the buckthorn, the buckthorn uh, during, in the spring and the fall, between the spring and the fall, of course, it will have the leaves are in the trees and it's producing nice amounts of this emoting in there. And then in the fall, it will release the leaves, it will go, the leaves will come down to the floor and they will accumulate in those temporal points. So as the spring comes, when the, this snowpack start melt, it start towing, then the, the, the composition of the leaves and the little branches and the stuff will take the mudding, will leach the mudding into the, in the first layers of the, uh, of the soil. The mudding is semi-soluble, so it will sit there in that first layer in there. So the water increases, then it's going to go into the water and now be available for the tadpoles. So what we found is the, the higher concentrations of emoting, and we we suspect this, right? We, we, we still don't have the numbers to prove this, but we know, but we believe that during this first time of the uh, of the year, in the spring, in the beginning of the summer, is when we're gonna have, find the higher concentrations of emoting in the, uh, in the, on the ground. So animals like the green frog, they have at this point really big tadpoles. Remember the tadpoles were born in the fall. They have at least six months to grow now. So they have now, some kind of liver function and they are able to survive in there. Also, they live in deep pools, which means that that emoting is going to be very diluted in this, all these huge amounts of water. So even though they have, they will be exposed to emoting, it will be much less at concentrations and they are much more prepared to deal with this, with this problem in there. So what we find is these frogs survive and we find tons, tons and tons of green frogs in the field station. Now with this guy here, the problem is, the, uh, again, they're very fast developing tadpoles and during this period of the year, they're gonna have very low metabolic function of the liver. So at this point, there is no way that this tadpole can metabolize the emotion. So if it's very little, it will die. And if it's kind of little or young, it will have serious um, a, hepatic problems in there and they will see, they will die. And then we see these frogs disappear or decline. So. This is what we think is happening in there. So why do some frogs remain and some other frogs disappear? I think it's because depends when the when the tadpole is exposed to the moring, it will be the chance that this tadpole will have to survive. So if you are a tadpole that develop early and have very low liver metabolic function of your liver when you're exposed to the moring, then you will die. If you are um, an animal that have more time of you, you have more an animal that have more time to develop liver function, then you're going to be able to uh, have much success in there. So what we find in there again, is that if the tadpole is exposed at early stages of development, the tadpole will die. And if the tadpole is exposed to later stages of development, it will survive. It will have some hepatic lesions in there. And maybe these hepatic lesions will carry on into the adult life. So we don't know how successful these animals are gonna be in the long run, but we know that at least they can survive the, um, the emoting and then go, go on in there. So bottom line is that we think the tadpoles, they are exposed to a later development uh, stages. Uh, they will have a better chance to uh, deal with the emoting and then they will be able to survive. When tadpoles, they are exposed at early stages of development, they will not be able to survive. And we think this explains why um, at the field station right now, we have very, very low uh, density of animals like spring peepers or coarse frogs or stuff like that. In my seven years in here, I haven't seen one of those. I heard uh, callings uh, of uh, coarse frogs one time, but uh, that's pretty much all I, I ever seen of those frogs. When green frogs, I've seen tons and tons of those. So we think that that's probably uh, the reason there. So this is um, why we think the, uh, the moring in, in these uh, plants are the ones that is, they are causing the decline of the populations in, the, in this species. And we think that this is also happening uh, across Southeastern Wisconsin. And uh, uh, we have some grants out that we are uh, uh, looking into trying to see uh, populations outside the field station in a, in a bigger scale to see we can uh, you can correlate um, diverse uh, abundance of uh, buckthorn with decline of populations in other places in other parts of the state. So bottom line, that is the effect of the buckthorn. So 
the bog thorn in, in, in the uh, invasive species is contributing to decline of the populations in southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, we have tested for ranavirus in the field station too, and we didn't find any ranavirus. Uh, chytrid fungus uh, not very popular in here, so we don't have that much in here. We did test it for it too, we didn't find it. So altogether, all these three things, I think, are, are contributing to the uh, decline of populations of amphibians. And at this point, we don't have uh, a solution. What are we going to do about this? Uh, we have different people working in different parts again, and we're trying to understand the mechanisms and the processes, but the frogs at this point, they continue to decline very rapidly. And uh, we've seen um, about 43% of the species again in the world, they are declining or um, already gone. And we see some, some improvements. I have friends that work in Panama and we see some improvements, some species coming back, but uh, most of the species um, they used to be in Panama, for example, they're gone. The field station doesn't have uh, early breeding species and so on and so forth. So I know I think I took more than I more time than I needed to take, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, I think that is uh, what I wanted to tell you guys. About.